I did. All right. Shashank, how you doing? Uh, so sorry, everybody. Uh, we are a couple days late. Uh, Shashank had a really swell time at Coachella and got a little case of the sniffles. So we are um, uh, back recording on Saturday. So uh, yeah, I, I hope you're feeling a little bit better now. A little bit better. Um, still a little sick. I think it's been going around. Uh, if you're in the Bay Area, a lot of people have been getting sick. Try to hydrate, get plenty of rest, drink your fluids. Um, I think it was like the flu or something. Hopefully, I don't get you sick. But fingers crossed. I got my flu shot this year. Oh, amazing! Yeah, uh, did you get your flu shot? I didn't. Isn't it kind of early to get the flu shot? Well, I got it like December time. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I don't know. I feel like it lasts, right? It builds a couple months. All right. I mean, like I got like a bunch of vaccines too, because like when I um. I was doing like some traveling at the end of last year. So I just got like every single vaccine I could possibly find. Mm. I don't know. I got just stuck a bunch of needles in me. Uh, so I think I'm just immune to everything right now. Amazing. I wish I had your uh, genetics <laughs> and, uh, and all those injections. <laughs> well, well, we'll find out. Like uh, I might call you tomorrow and be like, ah. I think I should have taken some before heading out into the desert to go, um, go to Coachella, uh, which is, why we kind of uh, didn't record last week either and brought something out from our backlog uh but it was a it was a really good festival um especially the production quality keeps getting bigger um louder more stunning visually like spectacular and uh i i noticed some visualizations um used ai generated animations and uh visuals uh from some of the smaller stages um but the uh, specifically, I think like the the DJs and I think I saw Kid Cudi too. Uh, nice. Show a bunch of mushrooms with uh, trippy uh, animations, like uh, merging into different objects, which kind of made sense and fit the theme of what he was going for. Um, but some of the bigger artists or bigger uh, stages had very robotic and AI. Uh, messaging in their videos. So even if they weren't AI generated, um, specifically the one with uh, Grimes and Anima, I was a DJ, um, they had this really amazing uh, detailed characters. One was a robot and one was uh, some kind of a human uh, hybrid. And uh, they were fighting over the earth. And uh, I think Grime came out in some kind of a... Uh, a werewolf costume or something wow uh, shot the robot in the head to free the earth from uh, <laughs> tyranny of uh, machines and um i think it's it's been on everyone's mind uh, it feels very fitting right now uh, even, even the artists they're they're trying to comment on how ai is overshadowing everything else and permeating every aspect of human society i feel like the artists are maybe scared um, I think they're scared. They're excited. They're trying to leverage AI and technology to uh, empower them to create more art or more multimodal art, for lack of a better yeah. word. Um, combine visuals and animation, lights, sound. So you mentioned that some of the uh, artists had like a generative AI animation. Yeah, yeah. How do you? So how do you know that? Like, how do you know that it was like? generative AI animations or like I guess I should say like what makes you think that it was like generative AI you know you can you can tell um I saw this last year too when uh I think it was stable animation or something even before that we had um we had ways to generate images with like Midjourney and Dolly uh, a while back and they just took those images and scaled rotated zoomed in pan left and right um, and then like generate another image and slowly like pan, zoom and continue that um, same loop and iterate. So you can tell when things kind of merge from one object into another and things look kind of cool. But if you start paying attention to the details, there's like an extra arm floating around or a hand with six figures or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> or like uh, objects that shouldn't exist. Like the mo, like uh, some kind of a weird Mobius strip that uh, is actually a house or something like that. I see. I see. 
Um, yeah, I mean, it sounds like Coachella was like a really good time. And um, what do you think? Do you think any of those artists uh, maybe used AI uh, to help them generate their music? Ooh, that's a, that's a tricky one. Um, I, I don't know uh, off the top of my head, um, but I do think these tools are being used by um, the post-production and uh, the people mixing and um, working on uh, the finer details because uh, we use a bunch of these tools ourselves to um, do some audio leveling, removing the noise. Um, and we were also going to start experimenting with uh, creating an intro and outro music uh, with a theme song with an AI-generated um, music website. Uh, I think it was Suno. Suno, Suno AI. AI. Suno AI is awesome. So for those that don't know, Suno AI is this website where you can go and you can put in like any prompt you want. Um, you can say like, I want um, a melodic dubstep about... Um, san francisco in the winter time and it'll make uh, like a whole song about that or like bluegrass music or japanese shamisen whatever you want uh choir music it will go and then generate it and it actually sounds super super good um so uh shashank and i were playing with that uh, like i think it was like two or three weeks ago and i was ridiculously impressed with the quality of the music now <sighs> I would say I would say that in general, um, the music sounds like you know almost as good as you'd get from like a regular artist. But I felt like the um, it, it didn't have the same kind of flow that you'd normally have with like an artist. Like I felt like sometimes like the beginning uh, of the song it's kind of hard to articulate because it wasn't always like this. But uh, I felt like uh, you know like how you have like a a, a song and kind of like maybe like will build. And then there might be like a drop or like some sort of thing. And then like, you know, keep going. And then like, it will sort of end in sort of like a, a nice uh, finishing way like where you kind of know the song's over. Yeah. I felt like sometimes with this, um, each individual section of the song sounded like amazing as if like a regular artist would do it. Mm -hmm. But the entire song to me didn't have that same kind of uh, coherent, storyline um that you would have in like a uh, a regular uh, song now i think this is like a super subjective thing because like you know what is like good music is highly highly subjective but like to me it felt like you know oftentimes like the, the song would go but then like it would end and it would end just like a little bit a little bit soon mm. i would say right like it was just like oh like i felt like th this should be like, you know, like a downbeat or an upbeat or Something like that. It just kind of like cut off a little early. But like, um, I don't know. Uh, I, I was like super impressed by what it's been able to give up. Excuse me. Um, yeah, I think uh, that kind of makes sense because um, uh, we even had a couple researchers and startups present at our early meetup events last year when they were working on generating sound with um, a bunch of uh, content that they had. Well, those are Dr. Maya. That's right. Um, she was one, and there was another startup. Uh, I forget the the name, but um, they had a huge library of sounds, samples, um, and hold recordings uh, with like uh, full songs and individual tracks with uh, individual instruments. And uh, they they built up this huge library because uh, they were just <clears throat> supporting artists and helping them create uh, more music by uh, picking samples from other instruments. And they were like, okay, let's let's build an AI on top of this. And they were focused on just generating, um, I, think, I think it was a couple lyrics, seconds right? at a time. Oh. I thought it was mostly lyrics, right? Uh, no, it was sound too. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they had, they had, uh, they had lyrics, um, they had sound samples. Um, and I think that's kind of what we're getting right now, where we're getting um, cool sounding music and lyrics that they're able to combine. But I'm guessing it'll take maybe another generation or another few iterations for them to take what they have right now and then um, build some kind of a, a you know prompt engineering uh, chain of thought style um, 
uh, uh, layer on top of that to arrange all these different interconnected uh, pieces and build a coherent three to four minute song out of that, which hits like all the uh, beats um, and makes it sound awesome to a human being. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Now, I I'm trying to see if I can maybe sign in and then we could play it because I think it should be fine to play it. Oh, here we go. Here's here's one that is generated like all AI and Suno since this is an audio podcast. That's great. Yeah, it sounds pretty good. And so we generated like what a dozen uh, dozen samples like these, and then picked one that we liked. Yeah, I think each one was maybe two cents or something like that to generate i think it was like um each well, i don't know I, I can't remember the exact pricing but it was very reasonable far cheaper than hiring a, an artist i mean this is really exciting we're jumping into different modalities um and uh i think uh this is how we'll eventually get to agi not by one big uh step function where we discover something new but just by piecing together all these different modalities and giving um, the LLMs today the ability to think in different uh, verticals. So that sounds a lot like Mark Zuckerberg, what he said. Um, a lot of, but, a lot of people yeah. have been saying that. Yeah. yeah. Cause like um, um, even open AI with uh, Sam Altman talking about Sora, he's like, um, we're, we're, we're adding all these different capabilities and combining them into one big model. Uh, Dolly was a separate model initially and then with GPT-4 they kind of just rolled that up into one big thing. So do you think that AGI is going to be a mixture of experts model? I think it's going to be you know I mean that's how the human brain works isn't it? We have a bunch of different regions in our brain which are all specialized to focus on specific things. Yeah. That's true. So it's, it's only natural to assume that if we're modeling these artificial intelligent things on human neural networks, then they would have similar behavior where you have specialized tools or specialized models focused on a specific domain and then something higher up orchestrating all those different models and yeah. forming true intelligence. So for those that don't know, I think we've explained it in previous podcasts, but a um, mixture of experts is a type of model that you can kind of think of like as like a, a team or like a company where um, it is one singular um, model that you will use. Um, but within the, the model, there's going to be different kind of like uh, sub uh, domains within the model. So like I like to think about kind of like if you have a company, you're going to have uh, your marketer, you're going to have your um sales or salesperson maybe your computer programmer you're gonna have your qa um whatever hr and each person uh is good at a particular uh, vertical or domain and then the ceo of the company will kind of uh, uh talk with all of them and make them all work together uh in unison right and that's kind of how i think of these mixture of experts models where um, you have uh, a single orchestrator, which will uh, talk with each of the individual pieces, parts of the, um, of the, of the model. And uh, in a certain sense, you're just talking to the CEO. So uh, it's like, you know, uh, it's like you're talking with a company almost. And uh, there's lots of sub um, processes or like, I don't know. I don't know the best way to describe this. There's lots of like, expertise within the model itself as opposed to just like one really smart guy so uh, that's a mixture of experts um so anyways back yeah, to where we were uh, speaking of that uh there's a new mixture of experts moe model out from snowflake and this one's like a a massive mixture it's, it's huge so for context uh mixtral had the most popular mixture of experts model i guess apart from gpt4 which is also uh, rumored to be a mixture of experts. But we have no idea because it's proprietary. Yeah, so uh, <clears throat> the ones that are public and uh, share uh, how the architecture works was uh, Mixtral, which is an 8x7b model, which has eight uh, 
smaller models, each of which is about 7 billion parameters. And now we have a new one from Snowflake, which is... Wait, so uh, taking a step back, uh, you said 8 by 7B. So, yeah, eight that means, the seven so that means there's 8 m- models mm-hmm. that are running, and then each of them are 7 billion parameters. That's right. So, so that would that mean that I would say like, okay, 7 times 8? So what is that, 50... Six? Yeah, yeah, fifty six billion parameters total. So it's uh, as roughly as powerful as a fifty six billion parameter model, but runs as quickly and as efficiently as a seven billion parameter. And that is uh, roughly uh, as much as you can run on uh, a new laptop these days. Okay, yeah, because I just um... entry level laptop was running uh, an 8 billion parameter uh, model Mm -hmm. on my MacBook Air, Mm -hmm. like a base model MacBook Air. And it runs fine. It runs like probably about as fast as Mm ChatGPT. So, and this was the new Llama 3 model. This is the new Llama 3 model, which we can talk about later. Yeah, we'll get there. Uh, So teaser for later on in the show. But um, yeah, we will talk about that. So anyways, uh, back to Snowflake. Yeah, massive, massive model. Uh, or, Or massive number of, experts in this one model uh, i i'm not entirely sure uh have you seen any benchmarks about how this compares to existing models you know i was looking they they claim that it's the biggest open source model mm-hmm. um which is cool as for as benchmarks i i don't know um i played with it a little bit so there is a um a, a the ability to go and play with it on Hugging Face, <coughs> have it hosted there, and it was impressive. I would say I think that to me it feels like uh, GPT four like quality. Um, wow, no. yeah, GPT three. You mean no GPT? The Snowflake model feels like GPT four quality. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, probably not quite there, but it, it feels very good. Huh. Yeah. So I'm looking at uh, some benchmarks in this Snowflake blog, and it's comparable to the new DBRX model, uh, which, which is supposed to be the best open source model before the new Lava 3 model came out. So very impressive and very small, very efficient. Um, but like without, without getting too uh, deep into the numbers, it seems like every company is trying to jump on this bandwagon uh, get their feet wet by building their own custom model, trading uh, with their own proprietary data and maybe some publicly available data. And we have a lot, lot of options. It's honestly a little overwhelming. Um, the previous King of the Hill was uh, DBRX uh, from Databricks, which was, I think, also a mixture of experts model. Uh, now we have Snowflake. Um, you know, I'm sure uh, Mistral is still going strong and working on the next generation of uh, both proprietary and open source models. But um, I do think that, the, that Meta has a bigger wallet than any of these little companies. Yeah. And well, Snowflake isn't that little of a company. So, anyways, uh, just for all the listeners to keep up, um, we're we're throwing out a lot of acronyms, a lot of companies. Right now, we're uh, we're talking about like three companies at the moment. We're talking about Snowflake, which is a company which does. I actually, what does Snowflake do? They like host uh, hardware, right? Like computers and stuff. Uh, yeah, mostly like data warehousing, I believe. Um, th- they're a data cloud. Yeah. So, th- would they compete with like all the big boys like uh, Google Cloud, and AWS, and stuff like that, or are they a little bit different? Uh, they're not as uh full service as AWS and cloud and Google cloud and Azure, obviously, but I think they focus on data hosting. Okay. Okay. So yeah. So, so Snowflake, they have their own model, uh, DBRX, uh, which is another model, which Shashard mentioned from Databricks, uh, which also happened to be kind of like the king of the hill. Um, it is, uh, very similar to the, um, llama uh models from uh facebook but potentially maybe even a little bit better a lot of people said that like the dbrx model from the company databricks um was you know uh one of the the best ones and then 
Another one Shashank mentioned is uh, Llama 3, which is another model. So all these models kind of do the same thing, but just made by different companies, all open source. And uh, that's the the new Llama 3 model from Facebook. All right. Yeah. So uh, take, taking a little bit of a step back, it seems like um, this field is kind of like maturing and I'm starting to see parallels with the mobile industry where you have a bunch of manufacturers, a um, bunch of software uh, developers that build uh, OSs on top of that. And everyone, everyone is working on these tiny little changes and pushing the industry forward. And whatever we say, whatever big best model that we talk about today, it's not going to be the same a week or a month or uh, definitely not like a year from now. Constantly updating. Constantly updating, constantly like pushing each other uh, to be better, be more efficient, cost effective, um, and try to squeeze as much as they can out of the hardware that we have because these things are expensive. The amount of money uh, they're burning and the amount of NVIDIA chips that they're using and maybe like their own chips too, it's just insane. Super expensive. Um, so I, I want to go back to like your analogy on like mobile, right? Because yeah. I think that like mobile is interesting because... <laughs> And and I, I agree with you in a certain sense, but right now with like mobile, there's really only two phone operating systems. There's iOS and there's Android. Um, uh, this is a very Western-centric approach, but sure. I mean, there's a lot of Chinese manufacturers who don't have the option to use Android and they're kind of forking uh, off to do something. Um, Android. And I mean, that wasn't always the case. We are what? Um, 15, 20 years into this mobile industry. But if you look back at the early days, we had tons of companies. We had uh, uh, Pebble, Palm, we had Windows try to take a stab at mobile. Um, it was it was very vibrant, the ecosystem. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with you that there was a lot, but this feels like a lot more. Like, yeah, sure. I, I don't think that there sure. was ever this many companies tried to make a phone operating system yeah. like maybe you had sure like uh pebble you said palm i don't know nokia yeah. um uh, google with android mm-hmm. or i think google bought android if i'm not mistaken yeah. um uh ios windows phone right but it was probably like <coughs> you know less than 10 maybe like for sure under 100 um like definitely under a hundred, but with this, there are over six hundred thousand <laughs> models hosted on Hugging Face alone. Yeah, six hundred thousand. That is that is a massive number. Yeah, that's what I'm saying, right? It's like it, it to me. It, it's like way different. Like in a certain sense, I, I wouldn't necessarily compare this to um, the uh, mobile phone companies but like i would maybe consider this uh, compare this more to like the internet like websites Mm -hmm. because if you think about like or apps like Mm -hmm. apps on top of operating systems or like you know websites where they're just like so many and then like each model um is tweaked for different things um i mean like a lot of them are like general purpose but some are fine-tuned for uh, specific use cases right yeah i suppose Uh, it's it's way more open than the mobile phone ecosystem there is no uh like single or monopoly or duopoly that's controlling all of these um other developers um or at least not anymore i think i think there there was a monopoly or duopoly when it was only open ai and then once we had all these open source models it just blew this field wide open to anyone and everyone yeah exactly um so i i don't know like i I agree that there are maybe parallels, but to me, this feels so much bigger mm. and just different, right? Um, because also, like, uh, in order to make a phone, it's very capital intensive mm. uh, because you need to actually build out the hardware. With this, I mean, it's also capital intensive. Very, very. If anything, uh, I would say more capital intensive. Yeah. I, well, I guess it depends on, like, what you're doing. Yeah, which layer of the stack you're working on. Well... But the thing is, is like if you're making a small domain specific model, mm-hmm. it's not that capital intensive. It's not that capital intensive, but uh, also the moat is much smaller. Your That's entire true. product company <laughs> might get swallowed up by the next update to 
ChatGPT or Llama or Gemini or whatever. Well, to be fair, none of these companies really have votes at, at all. Um, just because they are, there's all so many um, like uh, open source models that are like state of the art. Like this new Llama 3 model mm-hmm. is open source. And I mean, like, yeah, let's, it's, ta- let's talk about that. Okay. All right. We come on teasing yeah, yeah. it. So let, let's, let's talk about it. Um, so, all right. Llama 3, super excited. You guys may have been familiar with Llama 2. This is Llama 3. <laughs> so <laughs> clearly, 3 is better than 2. <laughs> exactly. Um, anyways, uh, it's a new model that Facebook or Meta came out with, I think it was maybe a week or two ago. Mm-hmm. And it comes in different sizes. Uh, they have an 8 billion parameter model, and apparently they're working on training a 400 billion parameter model. Uh, but before that, you missed the 70 one. Oh, a 70 billion parameter yeah. model. 8, 70, and they're still trading uh, the biggest 400 something billion parameter yeah. model. So 400 is huge. Like, just wildly huge. Um, I, like, we don't know what, how big GPT-4 is, but this would be, I think, significantly bigger, right? Yeah, I think GPT-4 was supposed to be a mixture of a uh, eight 220 billion parameter model so like open ai didn't even train a single model bigger than 220 billion parameters or maybe chat 3 might be a pretty big one but yeah this is massive for a single model so this could be like maybe an order of magnitude better than uh, gpt4 i i wouldn't say that uh because it's a single model as opposed to a mixture of experts that's true but that doesn't mean they couldn't do this as a mixture of extra small. I mean, we don't know exactly but how they're going to make it. Yeah, as far as I know, uh, they haven't mentioned anything about it being a mixture of experts model, which is kind of strange if you think about it. It seems like everyone's moving in that direction. Yeah. Um, but so one thing that is super exciting, and I think like the, the 400 billion parameter model is ridiculously exciting. But honestly, one thing that I'm even slightly more excited about is their 8 billion parameter model. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you why. So I was able to get the 8 billion parameter model uh, running locally on my MacBook Air, as I mentioned before. Uh, And it is really good. It it feels about the same as GPT Mm 3.5. So GPT 3.5 is the one that took the world by storm. It's the one that was the fastest growing app i think of all time it had like i i don't remember exactly but it was like 100 million users in like the first couple months Mm -hmm. and you know that's really good that's the chat gpt the free version that we all know and love it's super good Mm -hmm. and we now have that quality running on my macbook air it's in like my base model lowest end eight gigs of ram or maybe 16 gigs of ram anyways like lowest model macbook air uh m2 so not even like this year's model like last year's model (sighs) and it works just it feels just as good as gpt 3.5 but it's open source Mm -hmm. and it's mine i can run it when i'm disconnected from the internet Mm -hmm. it's small it's only a couple gigabytes and virtually zero latency or no network requests well yeah i mean you have to wait a little bit for like it to generate the tokens but yeah i mean i can just run it on my own data i can fine tune if i want to um like to me uh like i think like it's super fun to talk about like these new latest and greatest models but i think like for me like uh almost like the, these eight billion parameter models or like the small ones are like more exciting than the big ones i think it's more exciting as a developer um, the number of applications you can build on top of this locally, I think that's just uh, opens up a whole new world. And because it's it's free, right? It, it's, uh, I mean, it, it's not free, right? You have to buy the computer or whatever. Um, but like, I already have my computer and now I, I could do things that like I wouldn't do where I'm paying for a subscription to, you know, one of these big models. Like, you know, if, if I'm going to have to spend, um, you know, a couple cents for like every request. Um, I'm just, I, I don't want to do it. Right. Cause that like, you know, it costs some money. So like I have like, you know, some ideas of things that like I would maybe like to do, mm-hmm. uh, but it's just expensive. And uh, you know, 
money is not infinite, right? But like if I could run this um, locally, um, one, I have the privacy benefit of not needing to like hit their servers. So like they don't get to train on all my data. And some data, like I don't actually even want to throw that on. I'm like, if I have like some stuff, financial or medical data, mm -hmm. um, I might, I want to put that on there. Um, but just like, you know, if there's a lot of stuff, you just do it for free. And that's, that's really exciting to me. And so I like the way I kind of look at it is like the difference between a supercomputer um, and like a, a laptop computer, right? Like a, a supercomputer is really exciting because there's a lot of, uh, cool thing that you can do with it like i could simulate the big bang i could uh, you know uh, simulate the weather um fold some proteins yeah fold some proteins big financial modeling um really exciting like uh it's it's important that we have that because there's a lot of like really interesting problems but for your average person day to day like you don't need to simulate the big bang like you not can, that relevant to the average joe but like you want maybe some help like uh drafting an email to your boss mm -hmm. or um maybe do your taxes help you with your taxes your calendar. maybe summarize like the terms and conditions that you didn't like, that you said that you read right um like this is the kind of thing that like um i think a lot of people could use and it could benefit their life so like um well the, the big llms are really exciting like having an llm running locally on your device is in my mind almost just as exciting if not more exciting just because of the level of access it'll give to people i think as a as a tinker this uh gets me excited because i can have this run a bunch of agents locally and I'm all, all i'm paying for is the electricity which is pretty negligible on these power efficient uh um, m series apple max and you just have these running for free explore a bunch of different ideas um let them run in the background for a couple hours, come back later, and then voila, you have some mind-blowing insight that these mixture of experts have worked together for um, several uh, human equivalent days, and it's it's all free. Yeah. Um, we really live in amazing times. Do you have any ideas for anything that you want to build with these? Uh, like, now that we have this, yeah. like, you were mentioning, like, I think you had some ideas of, like things you want to build with an agent um i'm mostly trying to reduce the amount of manual uh grunt work that i'm doing for all the daily tasks that i have so um specifically for this podcast there's a bunch of things that we do to upload and uh research and um, format and publish so i'm trying to automate that process so it's a lot faster that would be a fantastic benefit yeah, yeah. If we could have an agent that would help uh, maybe uh, just replace us for the show. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe not yet. I hope you guys uh, enjoy listening to us <laughs> banter as opposed to the AI. Uh, but if you prefer, I mean, we could have like an AI for an episode or something. We could we could try to add an AI host. Maybe, yeah. We, we explore. Uh, maybe. It'll keep getting better. Yeah, at some point, I, I can I can imagine there being an AI that is more witty, more uh, amusing, and uh, more enjoyable to listen to than the two of us. Yeah, but like you got you want to hear us, right? Like, <laughs> we, we built this bot. Obviously, we're special. <laughs> They're never gonna be replaced. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Uh, all those other guys, though, like the problem. Us. Yeah, I mean, and Lex Friedman guy, he's he's gone. With the next next update to Llama. That's right. Actually, you know, one thing that I was thinking about um, is when we say that these models will get better, um, like a lot of these models actually don't like improve. Like once they're trained, they're kind of like as smart as they're going to be. They're not like actually like uh, iterating, like continuing to improve um, um, as much. Right. Uh, it's kind of just like, okay, here's your Llama 370 B. Like you use it, it's kind of fixed. And then like, if you want to improve it, um, I'm sure you could give like new information. Like you could use, um, uh, like, you know, throw it in a textbook or like ask questions about a particular thing, but it's not like it's actually like being retrained. Like once it's trained, it's, it's trained, right? Well, well, to be fair, I wouldn't say that as an absolute truth. I think that's just the way that it's being done right now, because once they train... <clears throat> this current generation of the model, 
um, they already have researchers working on the next gen behind the scenes. So they they don't want to keep pouring money into the GPUs and electricity to keep training the current generation while there's a new gen being developed in the pipeline. So uh, as a counterexample, I think you can look at the GPT-4 models and you see multiple snapshots that they keep, um, it's continuously being trained and we keep getting the newer and newer snapshots over time. But yeah, uh, most models, especially the open source ones that uh, companies like Meta train and then release out in public. It's it's just one single snapshot. Yeah, so I, I guess um, that's true that like the individual companies can keep training it. But I guess kind of my point is, um, I wonder. Just thinking out loud is like, you know, me as a human, I, I like to think that I'm maybe getting better over time, and I'm improving based off of like the inputs that. I've seen, right? Like, you know, I've learned from some of my mistakes over the years. Um, some people would say I'm getting better. Others might say I'm getting worse, but, you know, definitely changing uh, over time, right? But these models, in a certain sense, unless like the big um, uh, companies are, are willing to like continue training it, should they could release another thing? Mm -hmm. But then it's like a new, it's a new thing. And it's not like constantly being updated like the human brain. So like, I'm wondering if, uh, that is kind of like uh, a requirement uh, that in the future we'll need to have it where we can um, actually train these um, models more like in real time, even after it's released. Like, I don't know. Do you think like that, like that feedback loop is, is important or maybe, maybe it's, it's not actually that important for intelligence. <laughs> I'm not sure I see the uh, distinction that you're trying to uh, point out. So um, may maybe uh, this comes back to my analogy with uh, the mobile industry. So you have a bunch of these um, companies building foundation models and um, other smaller entities, startups, individuals, taking that and fine tuning it. So are you saying that it would uh, you you're looking for a future where you're able to take a foundation model, fine tune it, and then have the underlying base model keep getting updated with yeah, the same fine tune layer, like continually improving. Like as it gets more data, like um, it, it will go and then update, uh, like in real time with like new data, and just continually, constantly update uh, based off of every question that. I mean, we, we, do, we do have that today, but you just have to specify which snapshot you want to talk to of ChatGPT. Right, but I'm not GPT saying, model. like, you know, update the snapshot. Mm -hmm. I'm saying, like, you know, there is not necessarily, like, a snapshot, but just, like, it just continually improves. Yeah, so I think the problem with that is uh, reproducibility, um, QA um, behavior. If you've, like, spent all this time and energy to get one version of this model working with your workflow, uh, remove the hallucinations, uh, figure out the inconsistencies. You don't want to switch it up constantly. Yeah, I mean, I think that's true probably in some use cases, but like, what if I just wanted to get smarter? Like, how am I, how am I going to get like artificial super intelligence if I can't have like the model um, like recursively improve? I, I think... Um, I think you can only guarantee that if you jump from uh, jump uh, with each major version update. So from Llama 2 to Llama 3, uh, and GPT 3 to 4, and so on. But if you're jumping from like GPT 4 to 4 Turbo to 4 Turbo, Snapshot, 103 something something, um, the answer isn't always clear. Sometimes it's better, sometimes it's just different. Yeah. I don't know if you want that. Yeah, I mean, that's true. I, I guess just like, you know, thinking out loud here, like in my mind, like if we're going to have an abundant future, and, and I mean, we'll probably have an abundant future anyways, but like if we're going to have uh, rapidly, exponentially increasing intelligence, I think that like eventually you need the models 
to train the models. Mm -hmm. um, so like I've been thinking like, okay, like what you really want is you want like a model almost training itself and giving itself um, like more data based on the world, based on some sort of input. Like, I don't know. Uh, maybe in some sense, it'll be interact with the world. It'll be interact with different things. Based on that, it'll go and um, improve uh, based off the thing. And I think that um, ideally should be able to happen in 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 real time. And uh, it would just like continually getting faster and faster uh, based off of itself. And I think like right now, it, it's not really done that way. Well, um it, it depends on which aspect of this process you're talking about. I think uh, we are doing that to some extent at various layers of the stack. So um, if, if you uh, rewind like uh, 10, 15 years or something, people were building these models by hand. They were like uh, hard coding the weights. Uh, obviously, the, um, the networks were much smaller, uh, so they were able to... Uh, manually define okay this needs to be uh, this weight and you know um, uh, this gate needs to be like this uh, eventually we switch to um, you know gradient descent back propagation where we have these large neural networks kind of like uh, decide their own weights to fit the data and then we had like uh, hyperparameter tuning which is uh, automatically setting all these things uh, now we also have these models generating the training data to train these new models. So it, in some ways, we are slowly automating all these different tasks that humans used to do and replacing that with AI. So um, one of the big costs of training a new model is to actually use the current model to generate training data. Um, so depending but on how you look at it. But if it's t close to free, then it'll be even easier to train these models. So... Let's say let's say everything is free. Um, you still have to pay for the electricity somehow. That's true. That's true. You have a computer that your you know uh, older brother gave you or something. You uh, you have the model which is open source running it locally. You're still paying for electricity. And for some of these bigger models, that's let's just like solar panels in your backyard. Millions, millions of dollars. Well, you still have to pay for the solar panels. <laughs> True. I mean, I'd like some old free solar panels somewhere. Yeah, just like go dumpster diving for old solar panels. <laughs> Not a bad plan, dude. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, um, yeah, it, it's interesting because um, I remember uh, you you were talking that uh, energy is going to be the, the bottleneck. Uh, like there was that. That's what Zuck mentioned too, I think. Yeah, he mentioned that he wasn't aware that there is any one, uh, what is it, giga gigawatt? power uh station for um training these models mm -hmm. um like he's not aware of anything like that big there is no one gigawatt data center so so a gigawatt is pretty big really for, big. for context um the average household is a couple kilowatts i think uh single digit kilowatts so uh what is it i'm trying to remember it's like a watt is like what there's one watt and then a kilo is a thousand a thousand right. watts which is what uh maybe like two three thousand watts is maybe what a single house would use it's like a small house small house device with like a two people two, two or three kilowatts and so two or three thousand watts and maybe like a an electric car would charge at uh, uh the average plug-in hybrid 16 kilowatts or something oh so uh a, a plug-in hybrid is often bigger than a lot of houses uh it charges with more current than a house uses per minute uh, uh -huh. but you know you just charge for uh, half an hour to an hour and then you stop. Well, i guess that makes sense because yeah. like your car needs a lot of power and then like you're gonna that's gonna Charging take you. like exactly. a couple hundred miles and then like that add it all up would be less in your like refrigerator and lights exactly okay. so a faster uh charger which is the tesla superchargers they go up to like 250 kilowatts um and that is, that is like it, i think it took a lot of engineering for them to get to that number they started at 75 kilowatts which is a big number oh wow because like a, like a big house would be like 10 kilowatts so 250 yeah. that's like it's a lot a you, like a small neighborhood yeah at that point you're generating a lot of heat you have to first get the electricity there in those large quantities somehow from wherever it's being generated power grid 
um, <clears throat> you have to cool it um, and then make sure that you could actually put it into the device that you're trying to charge, which is its whole engineering challenge. Yeah. So to do that, we have a network of uh, energy producing uh, infrastructures, all everything from, uh, I, I don't think coal is that popular today. Uh, this leaves quite a bit of it though. Some, some, uh, not as much as it used to be. Uh, a lot of natural gas, um, some renewable energy sources. Uh, out here in California, if you drive down the coast, up and down, you see a bunch of windmills. Um, there's like farms of windmills that litter uh, the California landscape. <clears throat> and uh, there's a bunch of other uh, renewable sources. But um, large power plants, I think, generate um, several megawatts um, uh, nu- we were just looking this up, and nuclear power plants generate hundreds of megawatts. It was a gigawatt. Close, yeah. It, it's, it ranges from a uh, couple hundred megawatts to uh, close to a gigawatt. Wait, so um, let me just make sure I get this straight. And for all the listeners, it's a one watt. Like, yeah. So a light bulb would maybe be like a couple watts. A couple, couple watts, right? A house is like a couple kilowatts. Couple, like, so a couple thousand watts. Yeah um power plants power plant would be like a couple million watts yeah so like a power plant if, and, and the largest power plants a billion like a billion yeah so real big yeah really really big um so what mark Zuckerberg was talking about in a previous interview they listened to um we could li- link to that interview in the show notes yeah. pretty pretty interesting interview um but he was saying that he's thinking about making a one gigawatt um uh data center that is exclusively used to train these large language models so that's that's really really big Mm -hmm. um that's like i mean you might as well just build it next to like a nuclear power plant at that point Mm -hmm. um so very exciting but yeah i I do think that is a for sure a, a bottleneck in creating these things and it makes me wonder if like compute would be the bottleneck or if like energy would be the bottleneck, or maybe both really they're going to be two separate bottlenecks right like you know it's gonna be like the number of gpus you can buy or the amount of power that you can get to the power that you can use depends on which costs more it's a it's a trade-off right um if you're getting uh um cpus for cheap then power becomes a bottleneck um if you're getting power for cheap then you can use like I don't know, like uh, chips from the '60s, and they'll still be fine. You know, <laughs> they'll they'll do that a little bit. Yeah, because uh, I was so cheap. That's true. That's true. Um, but then, like at that point, space might be your bottleneck because mm-hmm. from the '60s, this is huge. Mm. Yeah, um, it was like the going back to uh, Ray Kurzweil's singularity. Um, at some point, you're just running out of uh, silicon atoms, so you just have to terraform other planets to extract all the silicon that you can because you need all the silicon that you can to, i'm ready. Let, ready let's go let, let, let's go uh take all the uh silicone from like the asteroids and uh go build like silicon not silicone oh, wait what did i say silicone S- silicone versus silicon yeah wait what's what's the difference uh one is used in plastic surgery one is used in uh computing Oh, silicone yeah. versus silicon. Yeah. That's oh, right. so silicone is the plastic surgery. <laughs> that's line. right. And then silicon yeah. is where we are, Silicon Valley. That's right. So it's just like an extra E. Uh, is, is it the same spelling? No, it's a different spelling. Oh, okay. S-I-L-I-C-O-N-E. Oh. I think the Silicon Valley might be somewhere in LA. <laughs> <laughs> or Miami, who knows? Okay. Um, All right, fair. But yeah, power... Um, at uh, at these large scales that these companies are operating, Meta, um, OpenAI, NVIDIA, Google, Power is is a bottleneck for them. It's insane. Huh. So let's imagine, let's like imagine for a moment that you were the head of one of these companies mm-hmm. um, and you were like tasked with building, you know, GPT-7. Mm-hmm. Like uh, what do you think you would do in order to like set yourself up uh, to be able to make uh, like kind of future proof it? Right, so that like you would have maybe like the, the computing and like power requirements to be able to do that. Well, one thing I might do is open source everything. <laughs> why? Why would you do that? Um, you know, it was uh, hard to understand at first, to be honest. Um, uh, when Meta started open sourcing uh, 
the first llama who were like, you know, um, they're just trying to get into the game. We didn't really understand why. Uh, it seems like that's all they could do because they couldn't compete with uh, OpenAI and Google uh, with the technical sophistication of building really good models. So they were like, all right, fine, we'll just build small models, open source it. But um, now we are uh, two versions um, ahead and Llama 3 is really, really good. And the number of things that people have built on top of Llama has been just mind-blowing. Most most of the smaller companies are using uh, the Llama models to make improvements, um, <clears throat> fine-tune it, work on the architecture, uh, apply to new use, use cases. So all of these other people building things on top of Llama are teaching Facebook what they can do with their Llama models. So I'm assuming everything that's going to happen today with Llama 3, Facebook can take those learnings and apply that to Llama 4. So I think it kind of like sets you up to build an industry standard with your product and have everyone contribute to make that platform better and um, get you like free information to build a better product with the next generation. And um, this is like a very high level forward thinking um, benefit, but he mentioned how they open sourced not specifically their core products like Instagram, Facebook, et cetera, WhatsApp, but the underlying technology that powers these things like uh, servers, uh, PyTorch, React, uh, a lot of the networking switches. And after doing that, a lot of the people in industry have incorporated those tools, um, improved it, and then Facebook reabsorbed those improvements and helped them make their core technologies better, um, bring the cost down for manufacturing and um, you know, it's like free work for them. That's true. That is a really good point. Like we open source the model. Part of it. Part of or, it. Yeah. Yeah. The you open source some of the core technology without exposing your product. Yeah. Cause I mean like people will, I guess we'll, we'll Facebook, you don't necessarily pay for the product. Um, in a certain sense you are the product. Uh, but that that's a that's a separate uh, conversation. Oh, but like if they open sourced all of Facebook code, then maybe like you know Google could have copied it and made Google Plus a success. For yeah, example. but honestly, like with Facebook, um, I think that their code is is not their <laughs> is not their secret sauce, right? Like, and like even if Facebook was a hundred percent open source, uh, everything everything was open source, I think that like they would still be a really, really big and successful company. Um, because sure, anybody could copy it. But um, the thing is, is like Facebook has uh, like 3 billion users or something. It's like huge. Like basically everybody who has like internet access has like some sort of account that is on Meta, right? Like they've got WhatsApp, they've got... Uh, Facebook, they have Instagram, um, they have all these things. And uh, I think that like the reason you go to to Facebook is because like everybody else is on Facebook. If everybody, like if I took the source code and I copied it somewhere else, mm -hmm. you wouldn't move because like none of your friends are there. Sure. Network effects. So I think that um, like that makes it significantly easier for uh, Facebook to open source things that like maybe other companies couldn't because like their core product in a certain sense is their users and the network effect and not actually like their engineering prowess. I mean, like it is like kind of, um, but it, even if I could like, you know, just copy it all over, like they have data centers all over the world to be able to host that. Like mm -hmm. it, even if I had the source code, it wouldn't be, financially possible for me to just like go and like run it off for and host it for 3 billion users. Yeah. So I guess uh, <clears throat> going back to your original question, uh, what would it take to build GPT-7? So um, open sourcing is one way to go. I think it's a very creative approach that's working for Meta. Um, another thing is, you know, you need GPUs. You need really, really um, performant, power efficient chips that are specialized for exactly the kind of thing that you're doing. Um, 
And depending on who you are, that could either be trading or inference. So do you think, do you think that, um, touching on those chips, do you think that will be, uh, like actually GPUs, like general purpose ones, or do you think it might be ones that are like specifically made for training LLMs? Like what's the reverse? They're no longer uh, general purpose anymore. I don't think these uh, H100s or uh, the, the B, uh, GB, 200s, et cetera, are good for gaming anymore. I think they're specifically focused on training AI models and, yeah. and a little bit of inference. Too. Okay. Um, so that's a trade-off too. Um, you build these chips for training um, and then they don't perform as well in inference and vice versa. So I think depending on who you are, um, these large model providers, they spend a lot of money on inference. Um, like, I don't even know how many people are hitting OpenAI's endpoints to call their models. Reminder, inference is just using the model. Yeah, just generating yeah. some prompt, uh, generating some response to a prompt. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, depending on that, get the right kind of chips um, and keep, keep thinking ahead because this industry is always evolving. Um, I just read, this was... Two days ago, TSMC announced a 1.6 nanometer chip. It was very small. I was like, God damn. I remember a couple of years ago um, reading that the limit, according to laws of physics, was somewhere around four nanometers, uh, at which point you reach like some kind of a quantum tunneling issue where these semiconductors no longer can... Uh, guarantee that a charge will stay in one place it'll just kind of like jump from one place to another because that's how electrons want to move uh, there, there's so little um, energy required to move from one place to another so it's like sheesh uh, it seems like they've come up with some fancy engineering to get around that issue we're getting smaller and smaller so this one requires even less energy it can cramp even more transistors in that place um, so yeah I wonder if you want to make GPT-7, uh, one of these companies might just want to buy TSMC. Since TSMC is the pretty much like one of the only companies, I, I think it maybe is the only company in the world right now that can make these chips. Like everybody uses them. Like NVIDIA uses them. They make 90% of the world's chips. Yeah. Like I, I wonder, because like, <sighs> I mean, I think we were looking at before, the market cap of TSMC is big, but... It's a lot smaller than some of these like big giant companies. Mm -hmm. Like, I wonder if they would consider just like buying or like trying to. It's not that small. It's like six hundred billion. Uh, wait, what oh, that? USD, yeah. Oh, six hundred billion? Yeah. <laughs> not that small. Uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe you could buy like their U.S. branch or something. Uh, maybe. maybe I don't know. Okay, I, I thought I thought it was smaller. I I th I, I thought it was like. 20 billion or something but okay 600 billion is quite quite large yeah so what do you need you need uh um you need this this technology to be standardized reliable um you need the next generation cutting edge chips you need like someone researchers working on better architectures for the underlying model lots of researchers lots of researchers and you need like lots of engineers to actually do the trading you need data um you need energy and so many things. And speaking of uh, uh, underlying architecture, it seems like we've we've kind of settled on this transformer approach. But there's there's a couple of other approaches being experimented with. Um, but before we get to that, maybe there there is also a lot of research being done in extending the context uh, window. Where Google released a new paper called Infinity Attention, which um, comes up with some fancy ways to. Um, keep going through like an infinitely long context window and keep that in memory and um, solve like this needle and haystack problem where you sprinkle some information in some corner of this data set and, uh, or, or, the, or the prompt and ask it a question and it will get um, this little tiny needle that you place regardless of how big the prompt is. Okay, so uh, lots of things there. Lots so of things. So, so you're mentioning uh, that you think that in order to make the GPT-7, we need a ton of data scientists uh, or machine learning engineers, lots of other regular engineers to go help. M ML, ML scientists. ML scientists. Scientists. Researchers. So 
let's say uh, we need uh, like because I mean you don't need that many, but like a decent amount. Let's say like best. You need the best. Let, let's say like twenty of the best. Um, you just throw money at them. Like each well, of them's gonna be a lot of money. <laughs> uh, like you know how much you need? Million dollars a year? Oh, the best. The best are very expensive. Who, who who would you consider like the best right now? Um, like who who are some of the best? Ilya Sutskever, um, Andre Garfathy. You know, there's a bunch of people at Google. The people who worked on the Transformers paper. Um, now they've kind of uh, branched off into their own companies. Um, so maybe you don't pay them like in like money, uh, <laughs> but like you pay them in stock that would potentially be worth a lot of money. Sure. Um, do you could make them a, an owner of the company, like give them like two percent or something. Mm-hmm. Um, so maybe like you get uh, the best people and uh, you get like 20 of them and then each of them gets like 1% or something like that. And uh, so then like you've got 20% of the company and so they have a huge upside plus like, you know, a million dollars a year or something like that. Um, that would be, you know, only $20 million plus like a lot of uh, potential value in the company. That's just one part of the equation. We haven't even gotten to buying the chips, securing funding for the power, um, or the engineers to build these models and deploy them at scale. Yeah, that's that's true. That's true. Um, so okay, so then maybe like what you really need to do is you need to like buy a big hunk of land somewhere like where there's really cheap power. Um, maybe like that's important next to like a, a nuclear power plant, mm-hmm. or like you could make your own nuclear power plant. Uh, or like maybe next to like some sort of like hydroelectric dam or um, like a natural gas plant or some sort of like orphan form of energy. Like basically I would, fi- okay. I would find where they're doing all the Bitcoin mining mm-hmm. and I would build my plant there. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe like uh, the Bitcoin miners, um, they figured something out. Cause like, I mean, like for Bitcoin mining, you want to find like the cheapest form of energy you possibly can. Because mm-hmm. uh, like it doesn't really matter. You still get like the same Bitcoin at the end of the day. Um, that's where I'd want to train my LM. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't actually matter where I am anywhere in the world. Like the, the model will still be the same. And I can just like transmit it over the internet. So I want a big hunk of land where I can build my data center. I mean, this is a problem that uh, Amazon, Google, and all the big cloud providers have been uh, trying to solve for a long time. Try to place the data centers as close to the source of electricity, among other things. You know, they think about like political stability and uh, cost of land and things like that too. Yeah. So I don't know, like somewhere like Nevada or whatever, uh, Montana. Maybe. Maybe. Sure. Um, I don't actually know where like the really cheap energy would be, but I don't know. it's it's all over. Yeah. The, the, the different places where you have the cheap energy. So, anyways. So we get like a handful of the top research scientists. We get a big hunk of land, uh, ideally next to a power plant. Maybe we could like do some sort of like agreement with the, um, the, the local government there to like get us like really good subsidies. Cheese. Which one? Subsidies. Yeah, subsidies. Yeah, because of all the jobs that we break. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you have to build the plant and like, you know, put the GPUs in there and Stuff like that. That that feels like a outright lie, though. All the all the jobs we're gonna bring with this AI thing. Well, I mean, like, think... but maybe that's a topic for another day. Okay. Yeah. So, anyways, we we can discuss that one later. Yeah. Um, but anyways, I, you can make the argument. So, yeah. all right. Uh, I, I think we are just about out of time, yeah. so I feel like we should probably wrap this up. But yeah, this is a good one. Anyways, uh, thanks for listening, guys. Until next time.